all right all right welcome welcome good peoples um and let me fix my countdown timer because if i don't we might not get out here on time um this is michael tech and strode uh broadcasting to you live from uh the jeffreyest of all manners uh jeffrey manor here in chicago uh, this is another episode of the Ujima Hour, your uh, intimate and informal look into the black social solidarity economy. Uh, I am your host, Michael Tech and Strode, founding coordinator of the Coldenut Collaborative. Um, and don't take that title too seriously. It just means that I stuck around for a long time and, you know, uh, kept doing some things. So I appreciate you all for joining the segment this evening. We have a very exciting guest on the line, uh, Malikia Johnson, whom we will uh, meet in a, a moment. Uh, but before we do that, um, there are a couple of things that um, I wanted to dig into before we got into our guest this evening. Uh, namely, you know, there's been a lot of exciting things that have uh, been uh, on the way um, as of recent, certainly, you know, every two weeks, you know that we do Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Uh, so um, if you are not aware of Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group, know that we actually have another session coming up this Sunday, uh, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, we are currently reviewing uh, a, a glorious text um, by Dr. Monica White. Um, Freedom Farmers, Agricultural Resistance in the Black Freedom Movement. We are digging into Chapter 2. We've already uh, in, engaged in Chapter 1. Uh, we had some uh, dialogue and discussion around that. Um, we're going to be digging into Chapter 2. Uh, if you're not familiar with Cooperation for Liberation, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a recap at the end of the show that really kind of talks more about that space. Um, but, you know, in short, uh, cooperation for Liberation really is digging into the uh, radical tradition of cooperatives that exist within Black community and Black history, um, and ultimately really trying to uh, engage and develop a culturally relevant, culturally specific curriculum um, that really in, in, in embodies, you know, uh, what cooperatives look like in Black communities. And some of that might mean that, you know, the, the principles might need to evolve, right? Um, so, you know, there's, there's those seven principles that are, are prescribed from the International Cooperative Alliance. Um, but, you know, what are the other principles that uh, might be specific to the sort of historical arc and, and the way that we have done cooperatives historically, right? Um, you know, and certainly when we did our retreat for cooperation, for liberation, um, you know, we, we, we were very rooted in, in liberation as a, as a specific and, and, and valued principle. Um, and decolonization is a specific and valued principle, right? You know, the, these are things that are important to us in terms of how cooperatives show up um, because cooperatives for cooperative sake is of no value at all, right? Um, so uh, just uh, make sure that, you know, you, you, you stick around after the show and we'll go ahead and intro just kind of time and date for the Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group so you can dig into that. Um, also, of late, um, so this past weekend was jam-packed. Um, November 6th through 8th was the Pan-African Solidarity Conference. Uh, we paired nations. Uh, this is uh, the, the panel from the, the Sunday gathering. So Friday, they had those pods and those mixers that were happening virtually. Um, Saturday uh, was the um, Pan-African Solidarity and Repatriation Gathering. Uh, Sunday was Cooperative Economics and Solidarity Economies, right? Um, and so that was where Colin, a collaborative, made a pitch, you know, on Sunday. But um, the entire gathering, you know, was really rooted in this idea, again, you know, um, what do solidarity economies look like through a, a, a Pan-African and international lens, right? Um, and, and, and how can we continue to build relationships, engage um, our communities, and, and connect to one another across these sort of, the, these vast, um, these vast Atlantic regions, right? You know, this, this sort of ocean that separates us. Um, we are not culturally separated. You know, there's a lineage, there's a history that we are rooted in. And how can we make sure that we're continually trading in that culture and in that history um, and continuing to root in those things? Um, so, you know, that was, uh, that was one part of my weekend. That was actually the latter part of my, my weekend. Um, the earlier part, you know, I spent with, um, you know, as a, a delegate to the Southern Movement Assembly 9. Um, so, you know, just uh, as a delegate of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. Um, so, you know, that was, again, you know, another very valuable space um, to, to really engage in. Um, and and this, this is something that I commented on, you know, just uh, as I was kind of 
rattling off online. I don't do too much, you know, social media chatter, but when I do, um, it's, it's relevant and it's specific to the moment. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I highlighted was just this notion that, you know, um, of, of folks who are, were kind of lecturing, you know, they were doing these online lectures that really talked about um, how the organizing starts now, or organizing starts today, organizing starts tomorrow. No, 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 it, it does not. It, it does not start, you know, um, at the moment that the sort of election is decided and it doesn't start, you know, I mean, it's been going on. And if you weren't there, right, you know, um, then, then, then that says something about, you know, your ability to kind of, you know, um, be rooted in that type of lecture. So, you know, I, I, I'm not going to spend too much time because I really wanted to highlight how valuable and important Southern Movement Assembly is as, as a model for how regional organizing happens um, and, and, and how, how much there is for, you know, for, folk, for everyone to learn, you know, in terms of how the Southern Movement Assembly gets done, um, how the synthesis occurs, um, what knowledge we can draw from there. And so the U.S. Solidarity Economy uh, Network was uh, represented there um, as in, in solidarity with the Southern Movement Assembly, um, in solidarity with the aspirations of the Southern Movement Assembly, and to, you know, ideally um, continue to build links and, and interconnect um, and, 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 you know, support, you know, support the work that wants to happen for the region. Um, so that was uh, something that was, was, was really, really valuable and important. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of final piece um, I, I want to kind of, you know, dig into is, um, this is two-parted here, right? So first, I'm just going to give you a preview of the, um, that's not the screen. Um, I'm going to give you a preview of the digital collage that's being built out um, in the Cooperation for Liberation. So um, as part of the, the sort of work of, of engaging Freedom Farms, um, we're working through, you know, this idea of uh, a digital collage as a set of resources uh, beyond beyond the text, right? Because, you know, people engage with text and readings differently. Um, but how can we actually build a different body of resources, um, you know, links to articles, podcasts, you know, um, YouTube videos and so on that really allow people to engage not only with the text itself, but with current work that is happening, certainly the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, um, is doing uh, some of that current work, you know, that's that's highlighted in the Freedom Farms. Um, but but just also, you know, what are the adjoining stories? What are the adjoining histories that are really important for us to represent um, as we start to get into a text like Freedom Farmers? Because, um, again, you know, this is not cooperatives for cooperative sake. There was a specific liberatory pathway that communities were traveling upon that led them to use cooperatives to uh, to enact self-determination, right, to pursue self-determination. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure that um, within Co-op for Lib, we're really uh, getting after not only the material that's that's highlighted in the text, you know, um, and this is a very similar way that we engage collective courage, but also getting at what lives behind the stories, what lives behind the texts and behind the histories. Um, so, you know, and, and also, Again, touching upon multiple ways of learning, you know, really, really designing a space that actually touches upon how different people take in information um, and so that we can we can address everyone's needs. Um, so, you know, that's uh, that, that's that's one thing that I definitely wanted to highlight for you um, in, in kind of thinking through, you know, what's happening within Co-op for Lib, what's happening, you know, with the Colina Collaborative. Um, and then there's... Um, so one more thing that I'm going to uh, share with you all. So recently, you know, I had an opportunity to write a piece for, um, well, I can't actually announce it yet because I don't think the thing is, 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 is due for publishing. Um, but, you know, I can, act, I can uh, talk about the piece. But I had someone who, who asked me to reflect on the intersection of Afrofuturism, anti-capitalism, and the solidarity economy. Uh, three areas that I am madly passionate about. Um, and so I did a piece that I, I composed, you know, for, uh, for that, that, you know, at some point will become published. And I just wanted to share a bit of that piece uh, for your consideration, um, which is sort of tentatively or, you know, titled Change Everything. But, you know, that's also the title of a, a, a Ruth Wilson Gilmore book that's coming out in February of next year. So, um, you know, I don't want to jump on anybody's publishing grids. 
Um, so change everything. What is the biggest story we can imagine telling ourselves and say about our future? Adrian Marie Brown, Afrofuturism, the world of black sci-fi and fantasy culture. In a 2018 interview on the Ujima Hour, I had a conversation with Dr. Kamau Rashid on liberated practices of the African diaspora upon escaping enslavement and the post-colonial vision of Julius Nyerere for Tanzania. Nyerere presented his plan in a publication entitled Ujima, the basis of African socialism. Ujima in the United States is often taken to mean cooperative economics due to its visibility as a principle of Kwanzaa. The original Swahili interpretation is closer to familyhood. Nyerere adopted this meaning for his approach to socialism following the departure of British and Arab colonial power in society, and Nyerere's vision was an extension of one's tribe, community, and family. Therefore, society bore a responsibility to support its citizens as one would a member of their own family. This approach was a deep departure from the political economy of African countries throughout the era of colonialism and later neocolonialism. Colonization represented a wholesale extraction of human and natural resources extending in part from the heightened industrialization, enclosure of common lands, and increasing labor exploitation taking place throughout Europe. As European countries reached the limits of resource extraction locally, Advances in shipbuilding enabled them to explore and exploit the resources of distant lands. The proximity and presence, presence and diversity of resources located in Africa were a bounty much too tempting for these European explorers. Colonization was not merely a technical process. There is something to be examined in the constraints placed upon our social, political, and economic imaginations, which was rejected by post-colonial governments in Africa. For colonial powers, all government, including police and military forces, speaking to the abolition movement at the moment, operates with the specific function of suppressing democratic decision-making and a more open society in order that extraction under capitalism may continue unhindered. Rejecting this colonial imagination required posing questions about what precisely a government and an economy were for, if not meeting people's needs and uplifting everyone in, in, in a society at the expense of none. These are lessons that I draw from the area's conception of Ujama as a framework for governance. It also draws me back to the other aspect of that conversation with Dr. Rashid concerning marinage and those societies which developed throughout the Americas as Africans rose up against oppression and escaped from bondage. These societies were present in Brazil as Quilombo, which Jamaica as maroon societies, and South Carolina as Spain for its vast wetland known as the Great Dismal Swamp. Dr. Rashid noted that Africans did not lose their the whole of their cultural memory as a consequence of being taken to the Americas, these cultural retentions they can't become the basis of societies they would form upon their escape. After Harriet Tubman launched a raid on St. Helena Bay, Combahee River Colony sprung up in the same region where, for, where the formerly enslaved residents built a cooperative society whose members committed to never work for white people again. We were not in the practice of constructing societies which mirrored the oppressive conditions from which we had escaped we built something better. My current focus tends to be concentrated in a framework known as the solidarity economy. I began this reflection considering what it means to be an Afrofuturist, an anti-capitalist, and an organizer within the solidarity economy. Capitalism is one of the many social technologies of colonization. It does not matter that we consider ourselves to be living in a capitalist society and must attend to what it values. We should not be in the practice of accepting these retentions of a colonization process that saw us become objects of capital subject to market forces. We should desire better for our future. Afrofuturist discourse can often endanger its best and most radical ambitions by imagining too many of our current conditions impo as impossible to change. I believe everything should be questioned and anything can be changed, specifically those things which we know to be oppressive. Capitalism as a system is one of those things. A post-capitalist framework like a solidarity economy is a different vision and a bigger space for us to imagine what else might be possible. A solidarity economy grounded in the values of solidarity, cooperation, mutualism, equity, participatory democracy, sustainability, and pluralism. A solidarity economy practicing mutual aid, reparations, indigenous land restoration, cooperative workplaces, communal housing, and direct democracy. To Adrian's question beginning this composition, what is the biggest story we can tell ourselves about the future? Why should we be afraid to dream that we can start building our society from a different set of bricks? 
I look forward to walking with you towards a place where everything has changed. So um, that will appear somewhere. I have no idea where that will appear. Um, but, you know, I will certainly share out on the Ujima Hour uh, page when that um, appearance is uh, made known. Um, and so, you know, uh, look forward to that in the future, um, uh, much more soon to come. And with that, um, I want to uh, make sure that we um, intro our guest. So, you know, we've got, you know, again, as I mentioned, you know, um, uh, wonderful, you know, esteemed uh, figure, you know, uh, bringing into this broadcast, Malikia Johnson. Uh, Take Care of Each Other World Tour, uh, Design for the Commons, Grassroots Economic Organizing, uh, Community Builder, Dancer, Oral Historian. Um, and, you know, and, and I, I, I certainly like this element of the bio that really draws on the sort of lineage um, of Vanessa Howell, Erica Johnson, Claritha and Willie B. Johnson, Patricia Kava, and Charles Johnson. Um, you know, so bringing those ancestors in, because ultimately, you know, who are we if we are not connected to a lineage? There's somebody at the back of us, uh, you know, many folks. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm really, you know, um, appreciating sort of bringing um, um, Liki into the broadcast um, because, you know, of the connection and the intersection between the Ujima Hour and the Take Care of Each Other World Tour. And I'm really excited to, you know, see sort of the origins of that, that uh, this project and this process. And then also really think about, you know, what does it look like for the future that, uh, that, that she is dreaming, that she is imagining? Uh, and with that, I will um, bring uh, Malikia into the broadcast. And, uh, and boom, here we go. Let me fix this. All right, uh, we have you on Malikia. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> much appreciated. Um, so, you know, um, why don't you uh, take us up the runway? Um, you know, you, we, we are where we are now, um, and we'll get to, you know, a lot of the projects that you're, you're working on now. But um, mm -hmm. what gets you to this point? You know, how do you, how do you evolve from where you began, you know, uh, up to this, this present day? What gets me to this point? Wow, that's such a big question. Absolutely. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I guess I have to start with, I guess I should start with my parents. Mm -hmm. They, they are these two amazing people that decided to come together and raise their children vegetarian and to follow the principles of my art and to meditate together as a family and to celebrate Kwanzaa. And so that's, that's how I grew up. And um, having that foundation has always driven me toward ideas like solidarity economy and cooperative living, but I didn't have those words to put on it at, you know, while I was growing up. I also am, I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, so there was no one doing that <laughs> where I was from or where I was growing up. And um, it wasn't until I went to college at Howard University and met other people who had heard of Kwanzaa. <laughs> and so that was a very exciting thing to me and also, um, Umoja Karamu and these holidays that I had grew up celebrating, but no one else knew what they were. And I always had to like overly explain what they were. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's how I come into this. That's my orientation to life still. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I think I started learning about cooperative cooperatives and cooperative living and cooperative structures in a formal sense. Um, at the end of my tenure at Howard, somebody, I was actually um, like a assistant, I guess, at the Mona Springer Research Center at Howard University. And so that group of people is just so cool. They know so much about black people and our movements and it was just so cool being able to be in the lunchroom with them, <laughs> with all those archivists and like just 
that have been doing this for years and have been accepting black, you know, materials and newspapers and things like that for years. And one of the people that worked there, Mr. We called him Mr. Dr. Conte. I think he gave me Jessica's book, um, Collective Courage. And when I read it, I remember thinking, this is it. This is the stuff. Why don't people know about this? I don't understand. <laughs> and um, yeah, and and so she started doing panels, or not started, but I became aware of her doing panels in DC. And so I started going to all of her panels, just like trying to soak up all the cooperativeness that I could, started going to all the one DC meetings because they were doing workshops with people in DC about how to form your own cooperative and what it looks like to, like what the difference between renting and living in a housing cooperative is, these sorts of things. And like through, um, what's it called? I guess activities, different activities, they did really great exemplary, and gave really great examples of how to do this work. And so, um, yeah, so from there, I started cold emailing a bunch of people in DC about cooperatives. And one of those people was Ajua Ifateo, who's one of the co-founders of the Elijah Baker Intentional Community in Columbia Heights. And I was like, hi. I was just like, you know, really just try to <laughs> get to know anybody. And I was just like, hi, can we meet? I just want to know more about you and about this cooperative stuff. And she was like, sure. And so I went and I met her and we had a great talk. And she was like, do you want to be a part of GEO, the Grassroots Economic Organizing Collective? And I was like, no. And she was like, you know, do you want to be a writer? This would be a good right way to do it. And I'm like, I don't really, that's not my thing. But I, I, somehow I, I just decided to look into it. And I had one of an introductory call with one of our members, his name is Josh Davis, who's an amazing guy um, in Montana, who's into this stuff. And he sort of sold me on the whole thing. And that's how I got involved in GEO. And GEO has like these, I don't know, these giants in the cooperative movement. It was Ajua Ifoteo, Jessica Gordon-Emhart, Jim Johnson, Michael Johnson. Like these, these people have been doing this forever. Like Michael works with Ghana's, Jim's been doing cooperative development forever. And so I just got, you know, washed into all that is the solidarity economy and cooperative living and thinking and yeah so i guess that's how i got into the tour sort of <laughs> and and i've done um you know done a little bit of background on the tour and just you know i i um so there was just this point where you were like, you know, I'm going to make a break. Um, I'm going to just start traveling. I'm going to hit these spaces. So tell us, you know, what what uh, what was the sort of decision point, you know, or the sort of fracture that kind of was like, you know, I'm going to take this tour. And, and, and also just give folks just a bit of background on how you perceive or how you think about conceptualize the tour, you know, um, and then just tell us what makes you say I'm taking off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the tour had actually been on my mind for like about a year before I had done it, but I was just trying to gather up the gumption to do it. I had actually, um, when I first got here from Howard, I went to Georgetown after and got started my post back in computer science for a year. And while I was there, I realized that I was more interested in engineering than computer science. And then I got really, I got a little bit involved into the makerspace while I was there and realized that I was really interested in what a cooperative technology might look like. And I can get into that later, but that was a pressing question in my mind. And I wanted to talk with other people about what that might mean. And, um, but I ended up not going on. So once I quit that program, cause I realized that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I got a job and was just like trying to figure out my life. And I went actually to California um, just on a break. And one of my friends was graduating. So I was, you know, there to support him. And he was also one of the managers at his garden, at his 
schools, to call it a garden is actually too small. It's like they have acres of land. <laughs> uh, um, so we were we were just at in the garden uh, for all intents and purposes. That's all I can call it. But yeah, we were in the garden. We were looking in these rows of lemon trees and orange trees, and I was just so happy. I remember just being so happy and we were picking food off of the trees. And I remember just thinking, I can't go back to work. Like I cannot, like this life is here for me, waiting for me, like to be able to travel to gardens and like talk with people about cooperative things and to have a good time like, this life is waiting for me. So that's how I got in. That's sort of why I was like, okay. And I went, as soon as I went back to, came back to DC, I was like, I put in my week and a half notice, it wasn't even really two weeks, it was a week and a half notice because <laughs> I decided to go. And I started working on the website and just like penciling it out and yeah, deciding to make a move. And it, everything sort of fell in line at the same time. One of my friends had was staying with me and she was looking for a place to stay. So she subleased my place and my neighbor needed a car and he subleased my car and so it was like all of these things that would have been burdens became not burdens and um it was just fell in line and so what the tour was was really me just embarking on these questions that i had that i knew other people were asking but i wasn't around many of them and i just wanted to go find them <laughs> find the people that i knew were asking the same questions i was asking uh, I, and I just sort of knew that there were, there were other people because that's how the world works. They're, you're not the only one asking questions. But um, yeah, and so it was just me. I called it an archiving project in the beginning. I'm not sure if I would call it that now. I mean, I guess, I mean, it is. It's stored at the Moreland Spring Art Research Center. I partnered with them to do it. So that in that sense, it is. But it really was just me trying to get a, a hold on what all of this cooperative stuff meant, that sort of how this endeavor that you're doing with the Ujima Hour, like trying to get at the nitty gritty, what does this mean? What does this look like? Why am I just now finding out about this at 21 or however old I was at 20? Why is this not a thing? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I just started asking people about what were they reading? What were they listening to? What were they how did they get into this stuff? Why and how can I archive this so that somebody else doesn't have to be 20 or 21 until they find out about these things? And so I started really thinking about archiving um, this work, but also it came to the immediate question of like, okay, it's in a library, but who's gonna be in the library? Or who? what if somebody's not gonna be in the library to see it? How do I get it to them outside of that? And so I started thinking about different ways of archiving like, Sanctuary Gardens, which is an idea I got from um, Lenona Odom in Philadelphia. She's a farmer in Philadelphia. They do the, that sort of thing. And just try, try to think about like different ways to compost these ideas. And then someone else, another interview I did in Sus named, with a person named Susan Weber. She's a landscape architect in Ohio that I interviewed. She talked about archiving through the children. And so those sorts of ideas became to be very interesting to me because I was just trying to think about how to do it outside of the, this institution that we don't necessarily have ownership of. Um, yeah, I think that's enough for now. <laughs> oh, no, no, um, and, and I, I, I feel, I feel sort of that 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 growing um, that evolutionary sense. You know, oftentimes I, I sort of begin this program with a bit of dialogue and monologue about. The fact that like I'm I'm just curious and I was curious and I kept pressing at the curiosity and you know mm -hmm. and we were kind of recapping a bit before this and I was like I've kept the production values low because if it's any more work that, <laughs> that, that, that that's needed for this I won't do it. Um, but yes, definitely the curiosity and the sort of inquiry and the, the questions uh, kept driving me. Um, and so you know you you you've established this initial archive. Um, is the archive capped? Is it, is it like, is it just in stasis? Is it just on hold for a moment? What, what's the sort yeah. of life of the archive and the life of the work in terms of how you have approached it? 
Yeah, that's a good question. And you can say, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I don't know either. So that's <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, so it's on my website. It's housed on my website at the moment. So if people are interested in the interviews, they could find it there, which is MalakiaJohnson.com. Yeah. But like I said, I do have an agreement with the Moreland Spring Research Center to house it in their digital archives. And so it will also be housed at Howard. I'm not sure how far along they are in terms of like metadata and like doing all of that stuff. And I just did start doing the transcriptions myself or like finished doing the transcriptions myself. So that will be, that's in the process. But yeah, so does that answer your question? I mean, it, if it if it's if it answers your question, yeah. Ultimately, it's <laughs> how, how you're thinking about it, right? Because, um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, just if that if that's where it is, that's great. You know. Well, I mean, I think like you're talking about in terms of evolution, like when I began, it was like, oh, I need to find a place to ha house it. But now I'm in a place where it's like, how can I? get these ideas outside of those institutions. So I guess that's where I'm at now. I'm still trying to figure out through things like placemaking and these toolkits that I'm that we're doing, like how we can just get the information circulating in a sort of way. That's where my head is at at the moment. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Then let's bridge it there. So introduce for us what Design for the Commons is and then, you know, um, how it kind of, it, it, if it's taking on the life of some of that, that particular work that you're thinking through, um, mm -hmm. or, or what it is in terms of how it evolves, how this evolves. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd love to. Um, yeah, it's definitely taking on the life of some of that. It's the continuation of some of those questions. Design for the Commons is a worker cooperative that's developing <laughs> um, between me Ajwa Ifateo, the woman I spoke about earlier, um, she was super instrumental on my tour. Every stop that I went to, she was like, I would not have been able to do it without her. Like specifically, there were a lot of other people involved, but specifically her. You'll see on my website, I add the co-creators for every stop and she's on every single one. <laughs> so she's been super instrumental in my journey and learning all of this stuff. Um, so Ajwa Ifateo and Ebony Gustav, is also a partner, um, worker owner. And so it is um, a space where we're trying to build beautifully intelligent systems, what we call them, so that care and connection can happen by design um, in anywhere people are gathered. So in the workplace, in neighborhoods, in church, in school, wherever people are gathered for a purpose, we would like there to be care and connection by design in those spaces. And so we started creating these toolkits um, to, which, which are really just mutual aid systems, but we've put a funky design on it and, <laughs> and um, made it a little more palatable for people that may not be familiar with these sorts of things, I think. And, yeah, have spread it to, so our first toolkit was the neighborhood toolkit. And with that toolkit, we sent it to neighborhood associations all over the country. Um, and it's crazy, but because there are these people, the neighborhood associations that are together for the good of the neighborhood. And a lot of them had never heard of any of the things that we were talking about, but in all of the cities, there are equal parts, you know, mutual aid things happening. So it's like, what is happening? So we're trying to bridge that gap a little bit, trying to get people closer to cooperation through the ideas of mutual aid, um, sharing, pooling, and exchanging, basically. If, if you're not familiar with mutual aid, I know I wasn't for quite some time. I was like, what is that? I don't know what y'all talking about, but sharing, okay? Sharing, pooling, and exchanging. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, this is definitely a continuation of the tour in the ways that it's still trying to sort of create a curriculum for myself and my community and to share with others about how we can do exactly what, I'm talking, what I was talking about before, which is creating care and connection by design, creating systems that are just running by themselves where it's like care is just happening here. 
Like it's not something, I mean, there need to be people that are keeping it going, of course, but like it's systematic, it's the idea, which is what we love about mutual aid. It, it kind of gives, it lends to the systems thinking approach and we're thinking about care and agency. So yes, I think I answered your question. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it, so um, the the design component of this, um, how yeah. how deep are you all kind of delving into that? I know that like, you know, so I had a collaborator on a project here in Chicago called Photonia, um, Ebony Hawkins, um, dear, dear friend, collaborator, um, now repping in Philly. But um, during that, that collaboration, uh, she brought us all together and, you know, um, as part of the members of the team. And we, we were engaging the human centered design curriculum, right? You know, as a part mm. of our kind of, you know, thinking, you know, we, we've done a few things, but just to inform our thinking about how we were going to approach this Photonia initiative. Mm. Um, so, you know, that has actually kind of rooted in me that, you know, um, now every time I'm in an organizing space, I want to introduce the, uh, the design thinking toolkit, you know, and, and De even decolonized design toolkits, whatever, you know, I want everyone to be thinking about how design informs the work. So, so how does it kind of factor into how, why you all chose design for the, for, for common? Yeah. Um, I think we were, we were more, we were thinking about the fact that when we think about um, ideas like care and trust, we often, it's like, there's this sense that it's sort of left at the chance, like, oh, we can't really do anything about it or we don't have control over it. And it's like, no, we can create systems that make this a predictable outcome. This is possible. <laughs> Care and trust can be a predictable outcome as a result of systems. So that's how, why we were thinking about it with, in terms of design, because it's like, this is not by happenstance. This is intentional. This is thought about from the beginning, like, I, I don't know how else to say it, but like, yeah, this is not just, oh, maybe, hopefully we can perhaps strengthen care in our community or perhaps strengthen trust in our community. It's like, no, this is, there's proven data, millennia, <laughs> millennia of data that if you share, if you exchange, if you pool your resources together, the predictable outcome is that care and trust will strengthen. And so that's what we were thinking about when we were saying the words design for the comments. It also was a play off of, the idea of the toolkits in general was a play off of um, a toolkit called Design for Distancing in, that happened in Baltimore. And they were um, creating, I guess, solutions for businesses and cities to like consider in terms of COVID and trying to get people to gather without, while being safe. And so when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's such a cool idea. What if we did the same thing sort of for neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. And so that's another place origin that we got it from, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. And so, um you we, we we go we tra we transit through take care of each other world tour we move through design for commons um we you 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 know through this through this time grassroots economic organizing is kind of interwoven here so tell me about your work with uh with geo or, or your work or your yeah. life because i also know you're doing some of you've done some interviews alongside ebony so mm -hmm. just you know, interweave that in Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so Geo, none of this happens without Geo. <laughs> Geo is an instrumental part of every part of my life, really. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so like I said, through the tour, um, Geo was instrumental in making sure that I found people in every city to interview. Because with the tour, so like it was very organic. It wasn't really planned like more than a week or two out. And so I'm traveling throughout the country. And so like within a week in advance, I'll send an email to Gio saying, hey, I'm gonna be in Detroit. 
can you guys connect with anybody? Also, if there's any lodging, like when I tell you nothing, like <laughs> I just had a bus ticket to Detroit. Well, Gio and this organization I was part of called Ubiquity in, um, at Howard University, which is the longest running Pan-African organization at Howard, um, small plug. But yeah, so with that network and Gio was how I was able to find housing throughout the tour and people to interview. Um, yeah, so they were instrumental. And then also um, at the end of the tour, I decided to do a small little like deep dive into a sort of to so to speak into Ayers Mendy, the Ayers Mendy bakeries in California. And so I was able to do some interviews with them um, again with my connections to Gio and stay at the I think it's called Mariposa. I should know this. I'm pretty sure it's called the Mariposa Housing Cooperative where Tim Hewitt stays. Yes. So <laughs> I was able to stay there and learn again so much and interview people at, I think I did four or five, I visited four or five of the bakeries and interviewed worker owners at all of those places. Um, again, me being able to say I'm a part of GEO was what got me in the door. <laughs> and um, um, yeah, so with that, I wrote in a piece that I actually tied to Queen and Slim because this was happening around this, Queen and Slim, the movie came out around the same time and I wrote a piece connecting my thoughts about that movie to cooperatives. And so I've written a piece about that on Geo's website. I also, like you said, recently did, was the editor, co-editor of Health Beyond the, Health Autonomy Beyond the Pandemic <laughs> um, with Ebony. And with that, we just, we talked about, yeah, like what, we just realized there was no one really talking about the food that we eat, exercise like we didn't hear it was just the scary thing there's this loss of agency that we felt with all this COVID stuff happening and we're just like that doesn't make any sense and we understand that doctors you know the role that they play in our society but we'd still like to just leave just to feel so helpless just didn't make any sense to us and so we decided to do an issue about what it means to have health autonomy during these times and also after these times and what it looks like for us to pull our knowledge together around our health. And not to say that it's, you know, necessarily researched and accurate, but to say, this is what I've done for myself. This is what I do for the people that I love. This is what's worked for us. And you, and you can try it too. Is you know, and that's all it has to be. <laughs> so yeah, we just finished doing a webinar with them. I mean, yeah, with with Geo and some articles. I also like to do speculative fiction writing in my spare time. So for that issue, I also did a speculative fiction piece where it was a letter between two black girls in the year I think 2021, and they were discussing what I called a neighborhood health study that one of the neighborhoods had put together as a result of the pandemic. Like they, I got this idea from some things that I saw in Detroit, but yeah, like they just took over a house that was abandoned in their city and put some furniture in there that they had that was old and just like created a weekly sort of get together around the plants that were native to their neighborhood, like to their city and tinctures and herbs and, like doing garden walkthroughs. One of the neighbors had a garden. So like, yeah, I like to think about what the future could look like um, and to get real specific about it. That's exciting to me. And um, we have another issue coming out later on this month called Co-ops Not Cops, which is our response to the abolition conversation that's happening. And so you can find another speculative fiction piece from me soon about what the world looks like if we actually defund the police. Um, so yeah, that's Geo is, Geo's the whole, it's everything. <laughs> They're everything. I, I, I have just so much gratitude for all that they've taught me and all that they've just, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I don't, they're just amazing, all of them. 
Well, you know, you, you draw, there's an intersection between the project I mentioned earlier, Photonia, and the, the health autonomy piece, which is, um, so as a part of Photonia, I was the editor of our, we did like this mag paper that kind of folded out into a wheat paste poster. Um, inside of the poster, there were like these different diagrams that we were using so that people could interrogate their own health outcomes and, and possibilities. Um, but, you know, a line that I, I put on one of the sort of front uh, the you know the 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 top top stack of the one of the issues was um, a line from Dr. Albania Fulton so not familiar not sure if you're familiar with that name but um, mm -hmm. there was a line from a text that she did that said in short you must become your own physician um, and Dr. Albania Fulton was uh, was well known here um, as a naturopath um, way back in the 50s um, on the south side of Chicago when the, you know it was not necessarily a black neighborhood in, in Inglewood. Um, but, you know, what that the that issue was really about, you know, that question of, hey, you know, yeah, there, there, there are physicians and you need to kind of be in conversation and in discourse and in dialogue with, you know, whomever right. the healthcare provider is. Um, so, you know, I, I, I really appreciate that health autonomy conversation, not to mention, you know, or to mention that, you know, um, Umedics was there, so certainly rep in Chicago, mm -hmm. um, you know, much appreciated there. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me, do you have a favorite line from that Queen and Slim piece or a favorite passage that, you know, was uh, that, that you'd like to hearken to or just kind of call out um, a little nugget? Ooh. Even if it's just a thought, you I, can paraphrase it if you want to. I, don't know. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't remember. It feels like I wrote it around this time last year, so that I don't know if I remember a line, but um, the really the energy behind the piece was that you know, in much respect to Lena Way and to the to the art and to her art, you know, it's not this is not to you know be combative in that way. Mm -hmm. I just remember thinking by the end of the movie, like we could have imagined anything, anything. <laughs> and this, this is what we imagine. Like this is, this is not even real life and we still aren't surviving. I don't under, I don't, this is too much. Like I just was so disappointed by the, for me, the ending was just like, I was talking about it for like at least the next couple of days. Like they just, we, we couldn't imagine anything more. Like, so yeah, um, the, the sentiment was that as creators, we have a responsibility for the energy, for the, I'm trying to remember the exact way that I put it. But basically it was something to the, to the effect of like for the dang, I wish I remembered the name. I would. I don't want to say energy. That's what's coming to top of my mind, and I don't want to be seen as like, you know, the girl that's talking about energy and. I don't, <laughs> but. We dig energy. But basically, what do you say? We dig energy here. Vibes is acceptable. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. But basically, creators are responsible for the energy that they contribute to, you know, and then, the, then that they put out into the world mm -hmm. and that as creators we just we have to take heed of that responsibility I think it was a sort of a call to take heed to that responsibility and I was bringing in cooperatives specifically the Ares Mendy Bakery interviews to <laughs> to um sort of showcase these are different ways that we can think about living this is not like we don't just have to say oh well is the world is how it is. Guess we can't do anything about it. Nine to fives and four hundred one ks and you know, doctors are like this is it. This is all we got. Like no, we can imagine more things. We're creative people. So that that was that was pretty much. I wish I had stronger words, but <laughs> but that was pretty much the essence of the article. Also, a piece that. I would like to recommend that I uh, mentioned in the article, I think. If I didn't, I should have, but there's a group called, or there's a journal called A Gathering Together um, that one of my professors, Dr. Joshua Myers, who was super instrumental in my 
development at Howard is one of the editors of, and they talk about, they sort of delve really deep into that conversation in one of their issues that I could perhaps tell you later and you share with people <laughs> that I can't remember off my head. But, but I remember at the time that issue also really affected me and me thinking about what Queen and Slim was offering to the world and just the potential that it had and that I was just so disappointed in. Again, no shade. This is just like my opinion. There's no shade to, to the art. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, and, and as artists, if we can't take the critique of that one another offers, certainly we are not ready for what the world has to offer us in response to our art. Um, and so you That's can true. that link to that article for folks who are watching in the chat. Um, so we got, you know, oh. Lakia's, you know, websites, you can catch the Take Care of Each Other World Tour, you can go to Design for the Commons and see all the toolkits, you can jump over to uh, Grassroots uh, to Geo and, you know, see that article on Queen and Slim. So you've got lots of ways that you can engage with the work <laughs> that Malikia is doing here. And please, you know, bookmark, save and, and, and dig into all of those. Um, and if you do have questions, you know, for Malikia within the broadcast, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We want to make sure that, you know, if you do have things that you want Malikia to speak to, that they are spoken to um, as I continue mm -hmm. on. Because now, um, you know, you've talked about the speculative fiction. And I, I, I love the conversational arc, how, you know, I had this, you know, Afrofuturist rendering of an economy, you know, that I was talking about mm -hmm. in the interim. And then, boom, you know, we get right back to this conversation about the future. And you, you, mm -hmm. you the, the phrase, um, I don't know if, if you use the phrase in the bio or if I stole it from some other notes somewhere else. But you talk about remembering the future. Um, so, yeah. You know, so, so dig into that phrase with us and, you know, and perhaps connect that to the speculative fiction that you are writing about. Yes, yes, yes. I'd love to. Yeah, so that was one of the principles I, that was grounding me in my tour. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to remember, I don't even remember where I got that phrase from, but cause it just feels like so long ago. I'm sure I credited somebody on my website. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so when I said remembering the future, I was just sort of trying to imply that we have tools to look to, to create the future, and that is the past. <laughs> and so by looking to the past, we can remember our future, if that makes sense. We can remember the ways that we used to commune with one another. We can remember the ways that we used to archive our ways of knowing. We can remember our social structures, our governance structures, and allow those to inform our futures in really vibrant and sensual ways. I like I really I I like to throw those words in there because I feel like often we talk about you know, these ideas about solidarity economy and a just world and equity. And I'm like, that just sounds so boring. Like, yeah. <laughs> like we would, and we need people to crave what is happening. And using, saying like, we're looking for a just world. It's, this, it's the same tone of like, your mom telling you to eat broccoli when you're young. Like, it's like, eat your broccoli, like, so, and people talk about having a just world in that same sort of fashion, where it's like, I mean, we're looking for a just world. And I just feel like, no, like, <laughs> we need, we need vibrant, sensual, turquoise worlds. Like, <laughs> those are the types of worlds that we, that I'm looking forward to. And so, yes, I have read Pleasure Activism. Um, and so that speaks to a little bit, I think more of it that I'm, yeah, no, Adrian Marie Brown is amazing, <laughs> but I think more so I'm thinking about, how do I explain? Um, hmm. Just, I just, I don't know. I just wish other more people that were involved in this work used more vibrant language. That's all. And that's another reason why we say design because we wanted to bring in that sort of excitement that the design world sort of gets, like that sort of texture and dynamism 
that they're allowed to have. I feel like we're not allowed, I don't know, we're not allowed, but we don't often see ourselves or hear ourselves using these sorts of words that enliven our senses in a real exciting way. I don't even remember what the question was. I just started talking about something I really like to talk about. <laughs> um, <laughs> remembering the future, right, that's what it was. So yeah, that's pretty, and that's another reason, like that phrase excites me. Like, ooh, what does that mean? Like, let's get into it. Like, I, I want to be pulled toward the world, not necessarily like shoveling toward the world that we're looking for. I wanna be like, I can't help but to look because it's so pretty. Like, it's just so beautifully intelligent that way. I have to go that way. This is how I feel. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. You know, yes, uh, we, we, we want uh, meals that are not only uh, fulfilling, but we want things that we, we not, not only nourishing, but we, we definitely want to taste that seasoning. We want to have that burger yes. that, that's coming in on the, on the you know, we, we want the flavor. We want that experience. We want conversation. We want liveliness. You know, we want we want all yes. of our future. Um, yes, and you know we we, we definitely want to make sure um, you know that 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 this revolution is irresistible, and the way to do right. it is to you know cook folks a meal that is beyond mm -hmm. you know beyond food, right? I mean, because well, mm -hmm. we, we got these we got these canned food drinks nowadays, right? Like you can go get nourishment anywhere. Like, you can just drink, you know, <laughs> throw a can back, and you know it'll nourish you. But you know, is it fulfilling? <laughs> Yeah, so so I, I right. that. yes. Yeah, so Yes, we want it to be a delicacy. Yes. Sorry, okay. I, that's no, it. no, that's... no, no, no. Do you think this <laughs> this this is your broadcast? Like you know what I mean? You've come into the Ujama hour. This is the floor, the floor is yours. Um what is it that you want people to to um to root in or learn from the course of, you know, the, the things that you have touched thus far, right? You know, I'll call it your body of work. You know, sometimes people take that and it's like a way, ooh, a body of work. But yeah, <laughs> own it. This is your body of work. So what do you want people drawing from your body of work thus far? Um, um, that... What do I want people? I want people to draw from my body of work. Wow, that's like, I feel like you're right. That is a little heavy. <laughs> that's a little much. I don't know. I want people to draw from my life, I guess, the way I'm choosing to live my life um, and the things, and the way I spend my time. That taking care of each other ain't that bad. <laughs> it's not that hard and in fact it's I mean there are difficulties but you know in fact it's it makes life all the more worth living and that um, it doesn't it doesn't all have to just be hippy dippy, I guess. I feel like a lot of people that are into mutual aid and cooperative stuff, it's like, oh, you know, we're, we don't have timelines or we don't have like, <laughs> like a structure to the ways that we do and, and or to the ways that we move. And um, that's why it's important for me to, to say the word intelligence when we say, talk about systems like beautiful intelligence, because there is an intelligence to the way that we're moving into the way. I think it reminds me of Capoeira. Like if anybody outside of the world of Capoeira is looking at it, it looks crazy. Like it doesn't look at all like there's any order to it. But to the people inside, it makes perfect sense. And so um, I, I sort of think about it like that. Like there's just an intelligence that we can tap into, that we can write down, that we can pass down and that we can put possibility into, if that makes sense, for others to contribute to. And, and, and yeah, create beautifully intelligent worlds. To sh and I just want people to see that it's possible. I want people to, people to be able to ask what if, 
like in the wildest dreams, what, what if? That sounds so cliche, but it's true. I do. I don't. I don't want people to do that. This past, um, I guess, p- summer, I also started a project which you could find on Instagram called the Sidewalk Project, where I wrote a bunch of what if questions on the sidewalk in chalk, which was a lot of fun for me because. I like to travel, but obviously because of the pandemic, there was no more of that. And so it was a way for me to sort of put my thoughts out into the world and to utilize the sidewalk as a sort of commons. And it's just, yeah, just me like exploring all these questions that I have. I was embarking on a bunch of projects this pandemic, like placemaking sort of projects. But yeah, so like with the sidewalk project, it was, I was asking questions like, what if the library had apple trees or what if, what if we did work that was nourishing to us? What if your job cared about your family time? What if what if we taught black girls how to do their own nails and start cooperatives? That is like something that I think would be so cool. <laughs> because we see people get their nails done. And it's like we could be we could just learn how to do that and do it ourselves. Like and they already have clientele because they got mamas and aunties and grandmamas that get their nails done. It's, I don't know, anyway, it's something I'm, so yeah, I, <laughs> what if questions like that, I also did, although it's not really been documented, but I called it, this project called Joy on the Side of the Road, where I was exploring, again, like the commons and like the interaction between people. So basically all the project was, was me dancing down the street to music that was in my ears. And there were people that would be like dancing with me as they drove by or like, putting their hands on like, hey, I see you. And it was like so cool, this idea that this person that I wouldn't have met in a million years and probably won't ever see again is just riding by and like we're exchanging joy. You could see people, I could see people smile as they see me dance because they're like, oh, wow, she's really dancing, like having a good time while she's walking. (laughs) And that was just so exciting to me. So yeah, like that's just in the way that I live my life, I just want people to see the joy and the intelligence behind it and the beauty that I'm trying to constantly imbue into everything that I do. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. You know, so, so that is the glorious arc. That is the glorious vision. That is the remembered future. Um, That is (laughs) the Maliki. Actually say your first name for me. Just so. Malakia. Malakia. Okay. Malakia mm-hmm. Johnson. Um, that is the remember That's okay. of Malakia Johnson. We we really appreciate, you know, the time that you have taken um and 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 shared with us. Um what's your favorite cap where to move? My favorite cap where to move? Yeah. Uh, I guess Jenga, the basic Jenga. Okay. Gets All me right. around the circle. All <laughs> right. I'm they lure the French, you know. I mean, <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, I, although I haven't been to a Hoda in a very long time, so you know, I'm probably very much out of step. But it circles always. Many of us have it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, um, so this is this has been you know uh, this episode of the Uja uh, the Ujama Hour. Um, the Ujama certainly is about cooperative economics, but more than that, it's about uh, familyhood. It's about you know uh, knitting together, weaving together, uh, caring for one another, as uh, we have been have, as Malakia has shared with us this evening. Um, I hope that you have taken some value in what was shared. Um, this broadcast will continue on in the Facebook ether, also on YouTube. So you know, make sure you catch it. Uh, in both of those places. Um, are there any closing thoughts? Are there anything that you want folks to, to look out for or just, you know, um, be aware of before we do close? Um, yes, check out, I mean, yeah, check out the Design for the Commons website. If you haven't already, download our toolkits. Let us know how you engage with them or feel about them and all those sorts of things. And I guess that's, yeah, that's, that's the work that I'm doing right now. So yeah, that's all. And talk to your neighbors, talk to your neighbors. (laughs) 
Yes. Um, a, a line that I've said um, quite a few times, you know, from, from Autumn Brown and from an early episode of uh, the How to Survive the End of the World podcast with Adrian um, mm -hmm. was, you know, this notion that, you know, in apocalypse, um, it ain't it ain't bullets. It ain't blue jeans. It ain't butter that's going to save you. You know, I'm paraphrasing. It's knowing who your neighbors are, knowing what skills. They yeah. Have. And, you know, and this is pre pandemic. So, I mean, you know, pre pandemic. Right. Pandemic shows you, you need to know who your neighbors are. And post pandemic, you still need to know who your neighbors are. Um, and so, mm. yeah, I mean, it's still going to be the thing that saves the world. Um, Agreed. So. Agreed. <laughs> all right. All right. So yeah. I, I much appreciate you to being on the broadcast this evening. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your words. And, you know, and, and, and if it's not too heavy, thank you for your wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. You know, <laughs> wisdom is an evolving thing. So I appreciate the time yeah. you with us this evening. Um, yes, and, and I, I bid you good evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Bye. All right, folks, uh, that has been tonight's episode of the Ujima Hour. Um, and, you know, I'm going to put Cooperation for Liberation's logo all over my face um, because this overlay is locked. Um, but it doesn't matter because Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group is uh, going to be happening again this Sunday, um, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, we are there on Facebook. Find us on Facebook, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Um, we, we meet virtually. Uh, we are talking about uh, cooperatives in the Black radical tradition. We are talking about cooperative uh, history and, and, and practice. Um, and, you know, ultimately, really just we're talking about the history because we want to, in this contemporary moment, use cooperatives as a strategy uh, for the, the self-determined, you know, endeavors of our communities. Um, so, so please, so drop into there. Freedom Farmers is the topic, you know, we're reading Freedom Farmers. We will we'll be beginning chapter two of the, or rather the recapping chapter two. Um, so, you know, we were reading that, you know, between the last meeting and this meeting. Um, so yeah, drop in. If you haven't read chapter two, we can figure out a way to plug into the discussion, uh, but know that we are a study and working group. So we will be uh, reviewing the text, but also we have a mutual aid endeavor that we're working on. So, you know, you will be engaged in that conversation too. Um, ultimately, this is a space that is built out for the purpose that people can uh, learn cooperatives and practice cooperatives together um, and really build their collective acumen to do some of the work that has been highlighted uh, by Malakia, you know, this evening. Um, so I look forward to seeing you there. Um, I also just want to make a, a sort of, you know, not necessarily a plug, but just, you know, highlight um, what's coming up. So, you know, we are at the end of our 2020 calendar year for the Ujima Hour Conversations. Um, it's been an amazing ride, you know, these past, uh, you know, 11 months, you know, or so. Um, but our, our last conversation in December is going to be with the Lita Torre, uh, Parable, of, Parable of the Sower, Intentional Community Cooperative. So we're really looking forward to that. Make sure you uh, drop back in with us on December 14th for that conversation. Um, and I am booking my 2021 conversations. I've got people identified, but if you know folks who should be on the broadcast um, that I should be talking to about the Black social and solidarity economy, um, intimate and informal dialogue and conversations, if you haven't seen them here, um, tell me. You know, let me know. Um, I'll make sure that you know we drop in to the uh, drop an invitation to those folks and bring them into that conversation. Um, ultimately, you know, this this is really about, you know, weaving a tapestry, building an archive of conversations with folks who are doing work that matters, that is meaningful, um, and, and then really just trying to unpack what the parameters and, 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 and ways that work is being shaped. So uh, make sure that you drop into, um, you know, uh, the next conversation in December uh, with Alita Torre. Um, and until then, folks, um, I am going to go lay on this couch. <laughs> or do something, um, you know, probably not reading. I'm not going to lie and tell you that I'm going to go read after this interview and after this long day. But I appreciate you all for joining me this evening. Uh, we had 10 minutes past, but, you know, we're going to keep doing it. Uh, cooperation, 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 free to land. Until then, peace.